Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Tonight on Where Did the Road Go, we're going to be talking about the apocalypse, the end of the world, and I'm going to read this little piece from Mel Lyman, because uh, it always kind of appealed to me. It goes like this, I am going to burn down the world. I am going to tear down everything that cannot stand alone. I am going to turn ideals to shit. I'm going to shove hope up your ass. I'm going to reduce everything that stands to rubble, and then I am going to burn the rubble. And then I am going to scatter the ashes. And then maybe someone will be able to see something as it really is. So, with that uh, ray of hope right there, uh, I'd like to welcome Red Pill Junkie, Aaron David, Hello. and uh, Joshua Cutchin, is it? Is Excelsior. It? Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, but I always, I always felt that poem from Mel sort of... Uh, it was really interesting to me in the way that it has that sort of creation through destruction sort of idea. Um, apocalypse, the, the word apocalypse means the opening of the eye, uh, which most people don't seem to know. It basically means enlightenment. You know, that reminds me, um, there is an anecdote about a Muslim cleric named uh, Rabia. And supposedly, according to the story, she was seen... Uh, running through a village with a pail of water in one hand and a torch in the other, and people asked her where she was going, and she said, uh, I'm going to set fire to heaven and to extinguish hell. Um, just for the idea that, you know, so people would act um, altruistically without, you know, some sort of reward or punishment dangling over them. Mm, mm. Nice. I like that. I think it's kind of interesting. It's awakening on a large scale. And I think what we've been seeing since, I don't know, probably the 1920s is an awakening awakening on an individual small scale. And if you get enough people awake, then that large scale thing, uh, reality as we know it, is going to collapse. Maya, the illusionary, illusionary world is going to collapse if you just get enough people awakened. And I think that's sort of what's happening. Hmm. I, I, I can see that to some degree. I don't I don't disagree with that assertion. Um, when was I that think, poem written, by the way? Oh, geez. Uh, he died in, uh, let's see, he died in 1978. He did, so uh, it was from the 60s? Probably in the 60s, yeah. He published a book in the 60s called The Autobiography of a World Savior. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably around the same time. That was 66 he published that. Mm. which is to re- set out to reformulate spiritual truths in occult history in a new way. I've never read it. Yeah, this one in the 1920s. I mean, you had Madame Helena Blavatsky. You had uh, mm-hmm. the Theos- Theosophist, and then Crowley, the Golden Dawn. And I think that all kind of fell apart and then reawakened in the 60s and 70s. And I think now it's all over everywhere. Well, I, I've always felt like there's there's an appeal to the end of the world when you look around and you feel like everything is just hopeless. Like, how are we ever going to fix this mess? Well, what if we just blow it all up and start over? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the Christian evangelicals are pointing to uh, Revelation 12 uh, with the woman. Are you guys familiar with this astrological uh, event? No. Uh, I mean, astro- astronomical event. Uh, coming up tomorrow it's a revelation it's and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars and she being with child cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered never heard that no yeah yeah. (laughs) what it is is virgo and leo Together with Mercury, Mars, Venus, Regulus, uh, she's Virgo is positioned her feet where the moon are, and Jupiter is the king in her womb, or the king to be in her womb, uh, that's going to pop out. So, I mean, John, the alleged writer of Revelation, said this is going to be a sign in 
the heavens. So John himself is kind of pointing towards this being a uh, astronomical event, and here it is. It's extremely rare. Some of this has happened before, but there's certain aspects lined up that is, I don't know if it's ever happened before. Somebody probably could tell us out there. It might be unique. Well, you have, and, and the, what, what kind of set this conversation off, and it was suggested by uh, Red Pill, was the rapture is supposed to start on Saturday. Saturday from this recording. Um, so, you know, if it happened and we're all dead, then you're not hearing this. Uh, but we're recording this uh, Friday <laughs> the 22nd. Sure you, you'll st- you and me will still be here, probably. Yeah, well, that could be. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'll read this quick article here. This comes off of the Huffington Post. Uh, there's yet another doomsday date approaching, which some claiming the rapture will start on Saturday. That's when certain Christians will get sucked up into heaven while the earth descends into chaotic tribulation period for those who are left. Several videos about the supposed coming cataclysm are going viral with similar claims, including a trippy clip above showing some kind of space queen giving birth in front of a seven-headed moon lizard. I haven't actually <laughs> watched that clip. Uh, but don't stock Sounds up- like my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> but don't stock up on Jim Baker's doomsday food buckets just yet. The entire basis for the prediction is bunk. The September rapture date came from a Christian researcher named David Mead, who calculated it would occur 33 days after last month's eclipse, the Washington Post reported. Jesus lived for 33 years. The name Elohim, which is the name of God to the Jews, was mentioned 33 times in the Bible, Mead told the newspaper. It's very biblically significant, numerology, numerologically significant number. I'm talking astronomy, I'm talking the Bible, and merging the two. Meade believes global cat- catastrophes will be caused by a secret planet called Nibiru passing the Earth on Saturday. The world won't end, but the world as we know it is ending, he told the Post. NASA and just about every astronomer said Nibiru doesn't exist. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. That, that pretty much gives us more than enough to work with. That, that surprises me because I would, I would think the, I'm certain he's an evangelical with a, a premillennial view of Revelation. I mean, anybody that talks about the rapture has a premillennial view, but uh, where I first picked up on this was an actual uh, astronomer on Earth Sky, uh, Christopher Graney, and he was addressing kind of paralleling the verse in Revelation, which I'm surprised it didn't mention that. That's like what this centers on i mean i'm i don't really watch tv and stuff so i don't know what the tv preachers are saying about this i'm sure jim baker's continuing to uh push out his buckets but um <laughs> yeah the article i read kind of broke it down how this is a very unique date the 23rd uh, with this stuff going on but i'm surprised i don't guess they know enough about astronomy to exactly uh i mean <laughs> every thing that goes down the these um sensationalist christians pop out of the closet with the date oh yeah yeah but i mean the world is always ending i do think there's something unique about this i mean it started with the lunar eclipse i think uh red pill you and i had some conversations about that uh dreams we both had and other people we had there was the mysterious universe article and um Uh, by nick rithron yeah yeah. What, what then, was that article? Yeah, you go ahead, Red Pill. Uh, well, Nick actually wrote a whole series of articles about people who were getting uh, dreams about uh, uh, nuclear explosions. Hmm. And the reason why it's really in- import- interesting to me is because I, I happen to be one of those people who had one of those <laughs> uh, dreams. I think yeah. it was on September the 6th. That I had a dream that I was kind of like semi lucy that was with some people I didn't, you know, know or, or recognize. And and I think it was in, I was inside a building or something and, and and we looked outside some window and, and there was this giant nuclear mushroom mushroom. And I don't I, I, I don't not, right now no I, I think Maybe I got the, the dates wrong about the dream. But anyway, uh, when people realized what they were seeing, they were trying to frantically escape. And some, some I remember some were trying to hide underground. 
but they got uh, buried. Mm -hmm. mm. Now I'm thinking about being those people getting buried. Mm -hmm. Is maybe that maybe that was connected with the people that got buried uh, uh, during the recent earthquake, right? Right now mm -hmm. in Mexico. Oh. Um, I, mean, I mean, so here's the only thing. Like, I, I agree that it's weird, and believe me, I'm, I'm the first person to acknowledge this. That within a few weeks of an eclipse, we had. Um, you know, wildfires, Hurricane Irma, the largest, you know, hurricane on record in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, the or the earth, the earthquake and tsunami um, in Mexico. But when you start folding out the post ecliptic consequences to the entire world, it's sort of this weird, like Western centric thing, because like yeah, I get sure. like I, I get there being an eclipse in, you know, over North America and stuff happening, weird stuff happening in North America. But like eclipses happen all the time yeah. is mm -hmm. my understanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, like the idea that just because there was an eclipse over America um, means the end of the world is, is, is a bit specious to me. Um, yeah, I would I, I would equate I would it like to your Saturn return, like. When your Saturn return comes, <laughs> stuff's going to happen to you. And so, I mean, I'm not on board with this end of the world stuff. I think that this is just signs. Red Bull, your, your conversations with uh, Jacques Vallée, he was talking about how Romans looked at these events. They had sure. such really good records about UFOs and stuff because they wanted everyone to report anything they saw in the sky because yep. their belief was that these point to... Um, Sort of like omens of things to come, which yeah, I'm on board with. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to. Uh, I think maybe we, we we should start more carefully if we hear this conversation, guys. Right? I mean, uh, all of this obs uh, obsession with the end of the world, and I was right now I was even tempted to say this modern obsession with the end of the world, but mm -hmm. I don't think that's true. I guess the West, the West civilization has been waiting for the end of the world since, you know, the rise of the Western civilization, basically, you know, ever since they, the, the Christians started to say, well, you know, Christ could come back any minute mm -hmm. now, any minute, you know, yep. and, and, and the, the historical since, view was post-millennialism. Uh, that's, it wasn't always the rapture view in there, but it's definitely dominated sure. for quite a while. Yeah, but let's get this something clear. We are I mean, you guys are living in the United States. I live in Mexico. We live in countries that were created under the influence of uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? right. And, and uh, uh, the Hebrew religion had prophets living, you know, 3,000 years ago that were uh, prophetizing about the end of the world. Even back mm -hmm. then, and 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 to the to the to the Jewish religion, prophecies about the end of the world is about uh, how if the people are not uh, like turning on their bad ways, like right, renouncing sin, then uh, God Almighty is going to punish us, right? So. In the Judeo-Christian view, the end of the world is seen as a punishment for our wicked actions. Mm -hmm. But there are other traditions in the world which have their own conceptions of the quote-unquote end of the world. But first of all, their view of time is different than ours. They have a <clears throat> cyclical conception of time, you know, mm -hmm. like... like the time moved in cycles, in, in, a, in like a equinoxes. wheel. Equinoxes. Yeah, exactly, right? And Which to this them, is the fall ex equinox as we record this. Sure. Yep. And, and to them, uh, they didn't see these uh, prophesized events about, you know, and, and, and the end of the world as, a, as punishment, but like a, it was... Like we, you were saying at the beginning, Saraya, a, a, an act of destruction that that was then followed by uh, an act of reconstruction. In other ways, it was a purification process, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and mm, like coming back to like a, a, a purer initial state. You know, there, there's all this talk 
about in 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 for example in the in the Hindu tradition of a golden age the, of mankind. Yeah, the yugas. The yugas, right? And the, right now, according to the yugas, we're living in like the Iron Age the or something. Yeah, the Kali Yuga. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I guess what what I'm saying is that to these uh, all other traditions, the end of a world didn't mean that mm-hmm. the end of you know everything. You know, it just meant like destruction that was followed by a rebirth and a new beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the problem is modern uh, exegesis, biblical exegesis. It's the TV preachers putting this out there. but I, You and like, your big words. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Interpretation. Uh, like, you go to Mithraism. Um, you had essentially Perseus slaying the bull, or Mithras slaying the bull. I think there's have been, been some modern uh, research around Mithraism, I think it's pretty accepted now that's um, uh, is a depiction, the whole Mithraic scene is a celestial depiction of us, the age of Taurus being killed, the that age dying, and the age of Pisces came across, mm-hmm. uh, came next in the, in the cycle of the equinoxes. So I go back to Crowley, 1920s, when this stuff started, Crowley's the first guy uh, said Pisces is dying. It's the end of the age, and the Lima is about this whole, um, you know, hot eat and new eat. Uh, this new god of the age, where in the past it was goddess based, land based, nature based. Then we came into the patriarchal age, like the Jews you're talking about. It was a very do this, and if you don't, you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Now we're coming into the age of Aquarius, where Crowley says this is the age of the conquering child, the age of Horus. So it is uh, back to biblical interpretation and how people misunderstand the word world. I always grew up hearing, well, the world was flooded. Well, if you go to some biblical scholar, they're saying, if you look at the language, the herm- hermeneutics of this, it's not talking about the entire earth, it's the world as they knew it. So this. It's tricky language, and I think pop culture out there, they hear, hears, they, they don't understand these nuances. Well, no, and they don't care. I mean, Guys are culture, making a buck off of sensationalizing it. Right. Pop culture wants everything to be simple. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't help anything anywhere along the way because, it, you know, there are people who are not necessarily simple themselves, but they, they get fed this simple stuff so it never makes them dig deeper, you know? If I wanted to put go out way on a limb with this uh, Virgo giving birth to Jupiter, uh, she's the sun is right at her shoulder. She's clothed with it. The moon is at her feet. Uh, the, 12, the crown of 12 stars, this is Leo, and Regulus is right on top. Regulus is the king, literally, if I wanted to put a spin on it, just like, you know, be extremely hypothetical, I would say that is the conquering child being birthed. And that all this stuff, all these events do uh, kind of give us a map for what's going on, where we are as a human race, and the change that we've been going through. And that it's about really to um, hit mainstream culture in a big way if i just wanted to speculate wildly (laughs) that's the best kind well especially on a topic like this i mean there's 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 so many different ways we could look at this type of stuff but let's let's deal with nibiru for a minute Mm -hmm. um speaking of wild speculation uh so nibiru the the concept of nibiru of this this hidden planet comes from Zachariah Sitchton, who claims to have translated it from the Sumerian. Uh, There are many Sumerian scholars who who have basically said, nope, those translations are completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gordon White makes the the good argument that Lee Sitchton was trying to translate these things, even if he did get some of it wrong, and I don't think he got it all wrong. But uh, he seems to have created a, a mythology around it that wasn't quite what was intended. Mm -hmm. Um, but he came up with this this idea of Nibiru, which is the 
the 12th planet, according to the Sumerian, his translation of the Sumerian texts, um, which is a huge planet that the Anunnaki came from, and they came here to mine gold to protect their atmosphere. And let's see if I remember all of this. And it has a 3,000-year orbit. So every 3,000 years, it crosses path with the Earth. Now, the first argument here is, obviously, if we look 3,000 years into the past, if it's the farthest out it could possibly be, we don't see another planet in our historical record. So we don't see a mm-hmm. cataclysm. We don't see any indication that anything like that happened. Right. Um, you know, and we may not have had the best records 3,000 years mm-hmm. ago, but I'm guessing that's something that would have been recorded. <laughs> it's a minor detail, yeah. Uh, two, if a planet was that close to us, like, you know, they're saying, oh, it's going to come by Saturday and, and cause, you know, the end of the world. Really? Mm-hmm. Because gravity doesn't quite work that easily. It's not like the planet can just sneak up on us. If there was a planet that, cl- I mean, consider we can see things like Jupiter and Mars and Saturn in the sky. Where is it hiding that it could get so close to us that it could possibly cause this type of devastation? I think Sitchin did what a lot of people do, especially the ancient alien people. They take myth literally. Mm-hmm. Oh, and he did. It, it's, I mean, take like Hermetics uh, with the seven spheres. Uh, those aren't like literal planets we're talking about. They're sort of maps of consciousness. So to get really speculative again, let's say that this Nibiru is a sort of symbol for a new consciousness coming, uh, maybe we can stick it on the tree of life as a new 11th <laughs> sphere or something. I don't know. 11th Sephiroth? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the thing that throws me, I always thought was kind of interesting. Um, when I had Walter Cruttenton on, he talked about how Nibiru is actually the name for Sirius in ancient mm. cultures. And it's like, oh, huh, and Sirius is moving towards us. And, of course, you have the Dogon who say that, and I I mentioned this in a recent interview, um, the Dogon who say their teachers came from Sirius, but they're not from this reality either. Uh, So it may have something to do with the influence of Sirius that makes us able to contact these people. But what Mm. if there's a planet that we can't see around Sirius that actually is Nibiru, that is actually occupied? (laughs) That's super fascinating. I just had a uh, guest on my show, Lynn Warner, and he's sort of a more bent towards academic uh, research looking into the Steely of Jew, or what's known commonly as the Headless Rite. Um, he was talking about, there's a popular book out there uh, with the name Chaos in it that says, I believe it's, I haven't read it, but I believe it says points to this headless god being uh, Orion. Well, Lynn Warner's uh, sort of hypothesis was it's not Orion, it's Sirius. So he does the Headless Rite once a month on the new moon, and he goes outside under Sirius, looks towards Sirius. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how many of you guys are keeping up with experience reports on people doing the Headless Rite, but since that popular book was published uh, saying, hey, this is something you should do, guys who are interested in it. There's been a lot of uh, interesting experience reports coming in again. So take it to that metaphorical thing or symbolic thing. I see some new stuff coming in consciously. If Lynn is right and it's serious, then that's what this headless god is about and there is new consciousness uh, being spread around that book is fairly popular out there now mm, never heard of it but i also don't follow the whole headless right thing so mm. well i'll go ahead and say it was in chaos protocols oh okay mm. um the so so the idea that there's a planet that's going to cause the end of the world you see this constantly you see you know People throwing throwing up videos on YouTube about how Nibiru is going to be here in weeks, and it's like you know what we'd know quite a long time before <laughs> anything that big got close to us. And Although I, mean, I will was, say, no, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Miguel. Oh, per, the before you know, there was with uh, Sitchin, Nibiru got pop- 
popular in the 70s, right? Then kind of like died yep. down and can, became popular once again. Before, in the middle of that, there was another uh, giant planet that was going to, to, to bring about the end of the world. I don't know if you guys ever heard of the world, of the name, the word Ercolobus. No. What was that word? Ercolobus. Ercolobus? Uh, yeah. It's, the Ercolobus was a giant uh, planet that was prof uh, prophesized by a Brazilian medium by the name of Ercilio Maes. Hmm. Yeah, died in 1993 and he said that this was going to come and uh, bring about the end of the world I guess in the year 1999 and there was a lot of talk it, uh, uh, it, from other you know channeling sources that were suggesting this idea of this kind of like a depurating uh, object or planet that will come and create a lot of destruction in our planet, but, and kind of like, in a way, kind of like opposite to the rapture, it will keep, get all the bad people, you know, trapped in that uh, depurating object, and the people who were, you know, here, you know, they will live in a second paradise. You know, it's kind of like the opposite to the rapture in which, you know, the Christians are expecting, you know, Jesus to come into their, in, in, the, in his mothership and to beam them up and to, to Sorry, take I, them to, to paradise. I was going to make a bad joke, but then I thought better. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah. so, you know, just to point out that it's not only Nibiru or, or the, you know, the planet X could be other, you know. Yeah objects you know well there was also the the nemesis star theory too that there was sure. a, a brown dwarf or something that moved close enough to the planet to uh flood us with you know poisonous gamma rays or whatever every so many cycle you know i don't know exactly what the time frame was hmm. now i i will bring this up um have you gentlemen heard about this uh anomalous object just found by the hubble telescope it said it's a pair of orbiting asteroids that they're calling mm. 288P. It's the first binary asteroid Gosh. they've ever identified, and it's in our solar system. Huh. So. Nibiru. Yeah. <laughs> All of us. Nibiru and <laughs> the, holding hands. It's both of them. The, the, yeah, they're holding hands. The, the, the B.I. and Nibiru it means by. It's two. It's two asteroids. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, well, these, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say, so it's your turn. All right. So go. I have uh, a friend of mine gave me this book a long time ago called Apocalypse Wow, a memoir for the end of time. And it was written by James Finn Garner. And basically he goes through history and uh, talks about all the different panics from the end of the world. Uh, I'm trying to see what the date on it was, though. It was 1997. Uh, but he talks about, like, for instance, in... Um, you know, in the year 1000, there were tons of doomsday predictions that once it hit 1000, everything was going to end, and mm -hmm. and and all the the other uh, things. It, like, there's constant, constant predictions of the end of the world. He does it in a very humorous matter. Um, you know, at least for the year 2000, we had a somewhat viable concern with Y2K. Mm -hmm. You know, even though it turned out not to be a big deal, that's because people fixed it. But, I mean, hypothetically, it could have caused a nuclear meltdown. It could have caused all kinds of apocalyptic stuff to happen. We're luck luckily, it didn't, and we're fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at least that one was, was based on something tangible. Uh, I believe a 2000, there was a date in 2001, I want to say May 15th or something like that, that some religious leader had claimed was going to be the end of the world. It seems like every year... Harold Camping? Maybe, maybe. It seems like every year someone's saying, this is it, this is the end of the world, and here's the math I did on our date system to figure right. it out. And it's kind of like, you know that date system's pretty arbitrary, right? <laughs> exactly. It, it's so strange. I would say probably 90% of them are fundamental evangelicals uh, yes. from a dispensationalist point of view. It's funny how that works. Well, they're looking for the end of the world because the end of the mm -hmm. world means they get to go to paradise. <laughs> yeah. 
And sometimes they get tired of waiting and they're trying to bring about the end of the world all by themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, there's yeah. a lot of, there are a lot of uh, the politicians are, you know, that uh, fundamentalist Christians in the United States mm-hmm. who apparently their interest to support uh, Israel is because they are convinced yes. that there's going to be, you know, the final confrontation, the Armageddon yes. in that yes. part of the world that will bring about, you know, the, the doomsday. Right. You know, Hank, Hank Hanegraaff, uh, who's known as the Bible Answer Man, he used to talk about that quite a bit. He was not a, a dispensationalist. He was a post-millennialist, millennialist, meaning he does not hold to a rapture view of Scripture. But he's a Christian, and he would lay people on the line, those supporters, in support of Zionism, because number one, the Zionists are racially cleansing Israel, and he's saying, if you claim to be a Christian, how can you support the racial cleansing of a land at all? And secondly, those TV shows of send money so we can send the Jews back to their homeland, Jeez. You're, you're exactly <laughs> right. The reason they're doing that is because of their eschat- eschat- but end time view, <laughs> and they know their belief is that once they get there, they're going to be massacred in this end time uh, mm. Armageddon. So they're essentially giving money to send the Jews to their homeland to be slaughtered so they, Jesus will come back. And Hanegraaff would lay this out very systematically and show just really the ruthless nature of it. Yeah. And, and, and let's, let's not forget the word Armageddon that people throw around so easily is really a place that the final battle of... True of everything is supposed to take place it's not it it doesn't actually mean the end of the world it's it's been taken to mean that but it is a place in israel is it israel where armageddon lies oh um, I think uh, they're in the holy land valley yeah. of valley of something i think but it's, it's where the final battle between god and satan is supposed to take place before the end of the world um, valley of megiddo yes that's it sure. Yes, yeah. you are and Bruce right. Willis is not going to be there. <laughs> yes. Um, so, and I mean, even, and like I said at the beginning, the term apocalypse means the opening of the eye. It means enlightenment. Uh, but it could also be taken to mean the opening of the eye of Shiva, which is, again, destruction followed by creation. Mm, going back to that Kali Yuga, which I'm finding, growing, having grown up in Christianity and being tricked every year by this, I, I just got sick of it, so I don't even pay attention to it anymore. But I got very um, interested in this cycl- cyclical view of um, the equinoxes and how we are in, according to Hindu stuff, in Kali Yuga, and how that seems, I like hate to say it because I don't want to sound like one of the sensationalist uh, end times guy. But now that I've, I've kind of come full circle, I'm like, it kind of does look like this is mass destruction is just around the corner. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're on the upswing from the Kali Yuga. And depending on what cycle you use, because there's, there's a big cycle and a small cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, going back to Walt, Walter Cruttenton, he was looking at the small cycle and showing that the small cycle aligns perfectly with procession of the equinox. So you had yet another culture that preserved knowledge of the procession of the equinox, and then you have the, the, the bigger interpretation of it, which is much, you know, is in like a million-year cycle or something like that, which is the more commonly well, known one. I don't know. I get excited. I'm, like, looking forward to it. So when our president, like, gave his U.N. speech and kind of put it on the line to the U.N., look, do something or we're going to do something, I actually got kind of excited uh, there, so I'm kind of I've got hope in this North Korea. <laughs> so you want the world to end, is what you're saying? Uh, for yeah. so long. <laughs> oh Jesus! I mean, and even in the Buddhist like tradition, this is the this is Maya. This is um, this oh, is I the world of illusion. Yeah. So I mean, real. This is not reality. This is just the world of suffering, and everybody's sure, trapped the- here. Yeah, but you are also kind of like hoping for the suffering of you know, millions of innocent people. Me? 
I mean, if you want, you know, you are really like hoping that something comes out out of all this North Korea thing. Well, I mean, I'm just kind of uh, tongue in cheek with that. No, no. I, 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 the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm not not different than you. I mean, I, I've also been thinking about the end of the world ever since you know I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was uh, drawing mushroom clouds, you know, on, on art class, and thank God there wasn't a psychiatrist there. You know, there was a probably be <laughs> in a padded room, you know, with a you know with a you know this training jacket. But anyway. I, I, I recently listened to Conor Habib, you know, who is a, a, a friend of mine. I think it, I've, I've, I've been I've mentioned him to you, Soraya, on, on yes. a few occasions. He has a, 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 a YouTube series in which he has spoken with people like uh, Gordon White and, and Alex Akiris and all that. And he said that, yeah, to him, wishing for the end of the world is just another way to, to you know, it's another suicidal thought. It's, you know, you want the end of the world because basically you are too much of a pussy not to kill yourself. So you want to, <laughs> you want the world to do it for you. That's probably easy for him to say because he's got success. And I think people with power and success, it's hard for them to realize a Buddhist concept that this is this is the material or hermetic concept that this is the world of the Demiurge and you're actually imprisoned here in an endless cycle of reincarnation until you learn better. And I think for oh. people that have power and success, you know, the Sola Busca Tarot is a dark ritual for an elitist family to put themselves in metapsychosis so they will reincarnate into this world and continue having power. But so think that's about it like, this way. Uh, sorry, if you want no, to go finish ahead. your thought. Think about it this way. Okay, this world is a school in which we need to learn, you know, basic moral, spiritual lessons in order to progress to the next life, right? And Agreed. If you don't learn those lessons, you're basically stuck here. You know, you re you repeat the, the school year until you get your test right over and over and over, over, over again. And But maybe... What you're saying could be interpreted as what happens if the school gets destroyed. Yeah, all all yeah. those kids will have nowhere to go to actually learn those lessons. So will, they will be stuck forever. I, know, I don't in think some kind of limbo. I'm, I'm not talking about a literal like wanting um, people to die and stuff. What I want to die is the the structure. Um, yes. I, I don't. I don't want bad things to happen to anybody. What I want. To die is the the institutional stuff. Which I understand. Is dying. We, want, we want the corrupt st st structures to be destroyed and demolished, and you know something new to erect. Yeah, and and that's kind of what I was saying at the beginning. Like I like the idea of apocalypse in the sense of tearing down the mess that we have. Like we keep trying to fix things, but maybe the only way to fix it is to throw it away and get a new one. You know. And yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's not a wish of harm to anyone as much as it is a sort of philosophical sort of idea of apocalypse, of end mm -hmm. of the world. Um, but on the other hand, we have to recognize that with the, these uh, four guys talking about this, um, only Josh is married. He doesn't have any children, so I, w I wonder if we will have we will be thinking the same way if we were parents. That's exactly back to my statement: the more power, the more success, the more material stuff you have, which be yeah. it children, the more invested the more, you are. The, yes, exactly. But mm -hmm. but I still think the the tearing down of the old to to make the new is is a good thing for our future and our children. Mm. You know the system. The system as it is now is broken. It's not just one country or one party. It, it it's an overall thing, and there's no easy fix for it because we're people, and people are freaking complicated. Um, but it's so ingrained now, and it seems like it's getting more and more ingrained with technology and the power that governments have. Mm -hmm. Um, that it's it's very frightening when you think about it. Like th there's going to come a point where we literally have no power to stop the people who we have elected to office. I understand, and and, and it is frustrating. But 
maybe there I say it, we have to be careful that maybe there is a, a, a very blurry line between this way of thinking and the thinking of a terrorist who True. also wants that, to that tear is, down is... literally the structures of power. Right, right. This, this is how I fight it. Um, I work around church people all day long, grow up around church people, all my family's church people. So I kind of have this knee jerk reaction. I had to listen to a 30 minute conversation, one sided conversation today <laughs> about the rapture tomorrow. So, and here I am in it again, but uh, it's not as one sided. I kind of have a knee jerk reaction. I'm like, well, bring it. Come on, let's go. That's just, but how I actually fight that demiurgic system or whatever you want to call it, this, you know, yeah, what we're true. in is true. with trying, like a, to put a Jungian term on it, um, individuation oh. that brings people to awakenings. And uh, I think a lot of people, you know, we talked about dark night of the soul. I think to get to that point, a lot of people are going to have to suffer a lot of loss, family, jobs, whatever, to get to the point to want to individuate, to integrate, to become a real individual and affect the world in a real way and not be a part of the system. Uh, that's what needs to take place. So that's what I like where I could fight this and um, trying to awaken people to sure. a much bigger reality than this system out there. Go get, go to college, go get a, a good job so you can pay off your college debt and then, you know, die in a nursing home somewhere. And like, like we were saying before we started recording, you know, that, the thing that happened here in Mexico, you know, on, on the 19th, you know, this horrible mm. earthquake. Mm. One good outcome is that people got literally uh, shaken up of their dormancy, their complacency. Right. And right now they're all, they are on their streets, you know, trying to do something and trying to show empathy and compassion to the victims of these horrible natural disasters. And maybe something even better will come out of it, you know, we'll, maybe we'll take a look at our society and the way that we're running our, our, our economic and political system and we'll, we'll figure out, well, you know, the people who suffer the most are the, are the poorest among us. So maybe we need to stop with this mm -hmm. horrible inequality and, and do something and, and make a better country uh, or a, a better society. But at the same time, I mean, I'm, I'm glad of that, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sad that all, that those kind of like uh, wake up moments happen yeah. at the at the cost of the suffering of of and other people. So at, absolutely. At some, right now, I'm thinking that okay, I want the 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 collapse of those structures. I want people to to wake up, and that if mm -hmm. that means suffering of people, then I I wish that the next the next person that is killed in in an earthquake is going to be me. I wish that then that that, that the thing that is the thing that we should aspire that that suffering. It falls upon us so other people get mm -hmm. the benefit of that wake-up call. I think you described it right as a sort of terroristic thought. Terrorism never works uh, because, True. you know, as soon as you guys get set back up, it's like 9-11 here. As soon as everything settled down, it's totally forgotten and everybody went to in infighting again. Yeah. But, but, but what, well, who so is I, affected? I, I beg to differ in a way because I think the, that the some individuals. People individuals that lives sure. were changed those are the ones who really their lives were totally changed and had this awakening to you know totally changed people's lives but as a general the general population just went back like that overnight well you, i back to this i think that the world a world was destroyed on 9 11 and and i maybe we don't see it because we are stuck in the middle of this, you know, maybe 30, 40 years from now, people will say, oh my God, you know, things started to change so rapidly than back then. And, you know, there was the internet and all that. So, <sighs> I don't know, I guess, despite my my nat natural proclivity to pessimism, I'm, I'm still somewhat hopeful that people, things might, you know, get better after mm -hmm. they get a whole lot worse, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, for me, hermeticism and Christianity, even though I, I can't tolerate a lot of the Christianity I see around me, those that's about that's the hope. And even I see in Hinduism, Buddhism, various religions, if you get past the facade of what's going on, if you get to really what they're getting at, that's like where the hope lays, that people who are somehow awakened and then go back into this crappy world and start to awaken others. But it's so messed up. I mean, you can see how even the word religion is a uh, has become taboo. It's not something you should even talk about. But well, having from mm-hmm. my point of view as a, as an outsider as a Mexican, I think that that many of the things that you you are describing are exclusive to American society. Particularly mm-hmm. this uber obsession with the end of the world. You know that's that's coming from <laughs> televangelists and mm-hmm. and and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and uh, a, a certain brand of Christianity that is exclusive to America. I don't see, I don't see that, you know, in countries like Mexico, okay. Latin America, Venezuela, you know. I think that, you know, that I don't know what the la- what, what was the last time that a, a pope, you know, talked about the end of the world. You know, I think Cath- Catholicisms, ca- Catholics are not really like waiting mm-hmm. for the end of the world the same way as you know fundamentalist Christians in, in the United mm-hmm. States. It all has to do with money. Sure, sure. And, you know, Mexico is does not have the the money like America does. It's not worth it for a <laughs> sure. televangelist to, to do that to Mexico versus the U.S. Yep. Um, I went to see uh, one of my computer uh, customers yesterday, and uh, they're, they're fairly religious. And he just starts going, oh, you see all the, the hurricanes and stuff and the volcano and the earthquake. You know, it's all in Revelation. And I'm thinking, yep, every time this stuff happens, I hear somebody tell me that. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's, you know, but it's like, it's just a mindset at this point. Yeah. I mean, I, I had to grow up with that newspaper eschatology. Everything bad that happened was praised as God's, our God is finally going to judge these people. <laughs> right, right. And so Ooh, that's yeah. why I have this knee jerk reaction. And, you know, um, like I wasn't thinking of, um, Red pill about the Mexico and the earthquake. That was kind of uh, un- not sensitive of me to talk about the North Korea no, and okay, kind of awesome. make a joke about that. But um, yeah, it, it just kind of disgusts me, and I'm sure uh, hearing about this day in and day out. And I think you're right, sir. It's a, it's about money. They sell books. There's lots. Uh, there's a guy named Khan. He's been selling books like crazy. The Y two Gay. I remember there's so many books published about that. I remember hearing Terrence McKenna say he knew um, programming guys or computer guys. And within, like I forget, a, a short period of time, weeks or months, they knew that it wasn't going to be a problem, uh, that they had it solved. But the sensationalization of it kept going much further out until y, you know, Y2K itself happened and there was nothing. It was just sensationalized and uh, profited on. Well, and, and the opportunity to make money off of, you know, Y2K Terror. patches and, you know, <laughs> Y2K yeah. books and all this stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, if there's anything, never let a good tragedy go to waste, right? Kelly and I, we turned on, we don't get cable, but we had a CNN live through YouTube or whatever during the hurricane. And I kind of got sucked into that, turning it on. I hadn't watched CNN or anything like that for a long time. And you get sucked in and convinced that that hurricane was headed straight for you and going to be mass destruction. I'm sure it was for Mm -hmm. some people, but they were saying it's headed to Western North Carolina, local news stations, just keeping everybody on the edge of their seat, sweating and biting their fingernails with this thing nonstop 24 seven. And it's just like day in, day out. Well, I meanwhile, the people in Cuba are having a really shitty, uh, crappy time because of it, you know? The, uh, I, I had a friend who just got his knee replaced, and he realized he was going to be in the hospital. And this, this was a few weeks ago when the first, you know, when the first hurricane was coming up the coast or, or being, you know, determined if it was going to come up the coast or not. Um, and he's just, like, panicking. 
Mm. He's like, I'm watching the news. They say we're gonna get we're gonna get hit really hard by this hurricane. It's gonna be the worst thing that that's hit this area ever. I mean, we're upstate New York. We don't generally just get rain, you know, um, from hurricanes. It's not an area that that hurricanes can keep strength up this far into the mm-hmm. into land. And one of our other friends just goes. You know, they just say all this stuff to scare people, right? Mm. You know? And this was well, not somebody who normally would even think that way, but it was uh, even obvious to him that this was just all scare tactics, you know, yeah. to keep people watching the TV. I'm I'm sure that uh, CNN and Fox News are already off of that and gone back to critiquing every one of Donald Trump's tweets. And meantime, like you, meanwhile, like you said, uh, Red Pill Cuba, they, if they would cover that, but covering... <laughs> real tragedy like that that doesn't that's there's no terror in that sure you know, because it's all brown people you know brown people who cares yeah. about them it's only when yeah. white people suffer it's like oh my god oh my god the end of the world is nice <laughs> yeah that that is a pretty much dead on now speaking of the end of the world did you guys hear about the uh, emergency alert in california no yeah. Oh, was, yeah. Uh, I just read about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 11, it was 11 a.m. on Thursday, and in Orange County, there was a, uh, it was a, um, a, a broadcast that went out over like, you know, network television that said, uh, you know, this is, this is, you know, this is the end of the world. Extremely violent times will come. Um, and uh, I don't think anybody's ever really taken the blame for it yet. <laughs> huh. Was it like a pre recorded emergency notice or? Yeah, well, they said it was because of some kind of technical glitch that would have, you know, that took place during what was just going to be a, you know, an emergency broadcast test. But it sounds sus- like the timing of this is suspicious. It makes me wonder if somebody somehow hacked in. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine being like a five-year-old kid blowing oh, in your bedroom here? Oh that? man, yeah. And, and the thing is that the first thing that uh, uh, that was re- part of that broadcast was part of the recording of that. Guy, remember that guy in 1997 who uh, got on the phone with Art Bell, the guy with the frantic call, the guy who was the ex uh, former uh, employee in Area 50, 51. Oh, uh, uh, the guy who still sells like lab materials and stuff? No, 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 Robert Lazard. This, this guy was never said his name. He was frantic and he was in tears and he was telling. Are the, the aliens who have been contacted by a precursor of NASA, whatever that means? They were not what the, we thought they were. They were extra-dimensional beings, who, which who had infiltrated the government and Area 51, and and he hung up the phone or something or got disconnected. And according to Art Bell, the whole uh, system also got you know disconnected. They had to go to the emergency energy. Or something. Hmm. So that was hmm. part of that broadcast Joshua is mentioning. That's probably when the Area 51 aliens died when they lost life support <laughs> oh, yeah, systems. Sure. <laughs> you know what, what this reminds me of? Remember that also mysterious uh, broadcast that happened in the UK in the 70s oh. with Brillon of Command, Com- Ashtar Command. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that I, was also uh, someone who hacked into the the, 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 the broadcast of this uh, uh, British uh, TV network and started mm-hmm. to send that message of that the, that there were aliens who you know were trying to get in contact with with our planet and I don't know what else was said. Yeah, it sounded very Doctor Who ish. Mm-hmm. Yes. Hmm. Somebody call Micah Hanks. um wow so i mean there there's uh i totally forgot where i was going with this there's so many different directions you can take the concept of the end of the world oh 2012 2012 Mm -hmm. was obviously a big one and uh i had written an article uh on my blog a few years before 2012 you know, and because people kept panicking, and occasionally people would ask me, "What's what's going to happen?" And I said, "You know, <laughs> probably nothing, because these are world cycles that that other cultures understand that, but we're very linear. We don't think like that. We don't think in cycles. We think in straight lines, which tend to be far less accurate uh, uh, than how things actually work." Um, 
But I said, you know, the ancient people did pay more attention to the sky, and they may know something more than we did. However, I will bet you we'll be here, you know, December 25th, 2012, and everything will be basically the same. Um, But it doesn't mean we didn't enter a new world. Exactly, exactly. You know, a new set of influences over mankind. And uh, Mm -hmm. there's a guy named Mitch Batros. And I have mixed feelings on on him in particular. However, his work is kind of interesting. He's been talking about how much the sun influences our weather as well as natural disasters and stuff. Mm. Um, And going into that eclipse, he said, you know, because it wasn't just an eclipse. We got hit with a couple of major solar flares. True. And he said, okay, he's like, if my, if my calculations are right, we're going to get hit with all kinds of extreme weather. Um, we're going to see earthquakes. We're going to see, um, and he talks about the sun's influence on us as well. So he said, you know, you're going to see uh, more hostility in, you know, in culture in general, more blowups. He said this will happen slightly before the eclipse, slightly after the eclipse. And then, of course, those solar flares hit, and, and the solar flares really can have an effect on you. Even if you don't necessarily recognize it, and I'm looking at what he wrote, and I'm looking at what's happened since then, and I'm like, "Yep, he was dead on." Whether it be coincidence or what, he hit it right on the right on the head. Are you saying the solar flares are responsible for the Rocket Man meme? The Rocket Man meme. That's 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 how yeah. Trump <laughs> calls Kim Jong Un. Oh, I try to avoid uh-huh. paying attention to Trump in any way, shape, or form. Honestly. Okay. Well, just politics he- in general. I try to avoid. Yeah, well, he's, he called that uh, before the United Nations, so, you know. Ah. Uh, <laughs> kind of uh, a big deal. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, so when we, when we look at these, and, of course, this, uh, this end date of the 20, 23rd? Is it 23rd, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's coming... Between the eclipse and here, we've had a massive, on, at least on the west, you know, in, in the western world here, we've had a, a hurricane hit Texas that's incredibly severe. We had one hit Florida and that whole area. We got another one that just devastated Puerto Rico. And this is all in the area that this eclipse went through. You had the, the earthquake in Mexico City. There's a volcano somewhere. Where's, where's the volcano going off? Uh, Mount Popocatépetl, but uh, yeah, it, it it did go off, but it was apparently a, a normal exhalation. You know. Okay. Okay. It was, it's sort of like a little burp, from what I understand. Yeah, a bur- a burp from Mount Popo. <laughs> so, so you basically got all these things happening in between the eclipse and the supposed end date, which I'm sure doesn't make people any more comfortable. Well. Think about it this way, guys. Remember that uh, famous Chinese story? There are these guys playing mahjong or something, and someone runs to them and said, oh, my God, the world is ending tomorrow. And one of them says, oh, I better go to the temple, you know, pray to the gods for forgiveness. And the, another one of them said, yeah, I'm going to go to the brothel, you know. I have one, I have one last good party. Another one says, "I better go to my wa- to my house and you know and say goodbye to my wife and kids." And one of them says, "I'm just going to you know keep on playing." You know, that's the idea of of the story. The moral is that one should strive to be like the guy who wants to to remain there playing mahjong. You have mm-hmm. all your affairs in order. So, yeah. okay, you're worried about the end of the world. Why why don't you treat Live your life as, as if each day could be the end of the world. That's one of the tenets in the Cas- Carlos Castaneda's philosophy. You know, yep. that rem- having a, every day a conscious realisa- realization that you are a being that is going to die. You know, and, and having that sense of your own mortality, you know, in your every conscious thoughts. And that's obviously hard to do. I don't. I don't claim to to have, you know, done it or mastered it in any shape or form. But you know, that's an idea. If you are worried about the end of the world, then okay, live your life to the fullest. You yes. know, because life is short anyway. 
it's it's going to be the end of the world for you someday. Regardless. Exactly. It's uh life life is short in the grand context of things, but it is the longest thing we know. True. Yeah. Uh, and of all the people who have died, nobody's come back to complain, so there's that too. <laughs> I think there are people who would argue with that story. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> And we lost Aaron for some reason. He seems to be completely offline, but... Uh, oh, my God. Yeah. The rapture started with him. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Let's see. Let's see if we can get him back. He, he may have been raptured. I bet he's going to be disappointed if he was raptured. Yeah, that will have been the worst for him. You know, end up in, end up in a Christian heaven. <laughs> Good big cosmic joke. <laughs> Nice. Uh, oh man. He's, you there, Sorry Aaron? about that. Sorry about that. I thought we, we, I thought we Jesus. We, <laughs> Jesus, we, we, we were was, speculating you clouds. got raptured. I thought it was. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so oh. you're you're still with us. So would the rapture? Would you being raptured be like hell to you? Me? Yeah. Um. You know, my perspective of the universe and afterlife and stuff has expanded a whole lot uh, since 2012. That was my date of my divorce, followed by my dad dying, followed by my mom being um, diagnosed with dementia and my own sort of crisis of faith. So my world did go away then. And uh, if there was such a thing as the rapture, um, which I, I'm reformed, so I don't believe in it in the first place. But right, because it's it is it is a non-biblical concept, right? I mean, it's a post. It's it's basically a theological concept. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's fairly new on the scene compared to older interpretations of scripture, like for instance. Well, I, anyway, to answer your question, uh, I would go with it um, because I think I don't think the the concept that we have typically of heaven and what it is and stuff is is right either. So yeah, I would be happy to. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to remain here. Okay, fair enough. Don't you guys agree that the f the the final act of close encounters of the third kind is kind of like closest representation pop culture has had of the rapture. I mean, well, the mother ship is is a, it's like a symbolism of the new Jerusalem. You f you forget the uh, the blockbuster Left Behind series. I have never seen them. Uh, I've never, I've never I, I, seen I haven't them seen them either. I haven't seen them either. <laughs> no, but but to to the point, like yes, there is. There is a strong, um, I think there's a strong corollary there, and I think it's it's got to be deliberate. Oh, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so, numerous times in my life, I've had premonitions that I was going to die. And I never really knew how to take these, like, you know, just be like, I would know that this, this was it. Within, you know, a very short period, I was going to die. And what would happen inevitably every single time is my life would change in some massive way. Mm -hmm. Like, there was never an injury or anything even remotely like that. But, like, the concept of death was seemed to be symbolic to me. Like, the, these premonitions would be symbolic instead of representing actual death. They would... uh they would represent change, which, of course, when you look at the tarot, that's exactly what the death cards, mm -hmm. you know, rep, uh, represents is change. Um, mm -hmm. And when you look at the concept of the apocalypse, again, it's change. You know, there's, there's I don't know, to me, there is there's no such actual thing as death. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, on, on a very basic level there is, but I don't think anything actually ends. Mm -hmm. I think life is change. Yes. And uh, that, that where we have a, such a hard time with um, is the appropriating mind that grabs and says, I'm this, I'm this, I'm not this, I'm this, uh, this yes. is what I am. And that's so resistant to change. Well, sure, because you want to lock it all down and feel safe. Yeah. 
and safe is an illusion. Mm hmm. Say, yeah, the world is not safe and it never will be. It's not meant to be safe. For whatever True. reason that we're here, it's not to feel safe and comforted. If we can create that illusion the best we can, fantastic. Um, it's not a bad thing to feel safe, but that realization that at any moment we could be hit by, you know, an asteroid, an earthquake, a tornado, you know, depending on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. and and these maybe that upset. Oh, sorry, go, go. No, go ahead. Maybe that obsession with uh, American obsession with the end of the world is because you have you guys have become <laughs> too safe. Have become mm -hmm. well, yeah. Soft. We secretly want it to get mm -hmm. us out of this rat race. <laughs> yeah. We want it. Not, not, not to mention that there are, there are plenty of gamers out there who fully believe they want the zombie apocalypse. True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, they, they think it'll be fun. <laughs> Most of them would probably be the first to fall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, speaking of uh, um, resistance to change, I think of my dad who spent like something like 44 years in the same job. Um, this is for security so he could have a family so I could, you know, become who I became. But um, the security so stifled. I believe his it stifles people's spirituality, their creativity, and so like my goal in life is to fight that system and to go do what other people are afraid to do, and not not be part of this um, rat race stuff. And it's it's very hard because the system is literally set up to make everyone a part of it, um, but not too much a part of it. You know, you don't get a controlling share. Mm hmm. I think of Beck's song, I'm a Loser Baby, so why don't you kill me? <laughs> that, that was one of my favorite songs growing up. The, you know, and, it, it, and we hear so much about, like, race relations and things like that nowadays. And, I mean, that, that's always been an issue in our culture for whatever reason. I don't, I don't understand why it's race. That, that, I mean, because we're all the human race. We're all genetically connected. It's not like we're, you know, it's dogs and cats. Um, but you know, although that is a factor, the other factor is money mm -hmm. yeah. because, you know, it's, you don't see rich people getting treated like poor people, regardless of the color of their skin. So I think that the rational mind is designed to categorize, uh, to separate and money is a symbol. It's a way to do that. I have money. You don't. So I'm better than you. Right. Or yes. You stay over there because of your skin color. I'll stay over here because of my skin color. So the rational mind is just constantly dividing, making divisions all through life with all kinds of things. And uh, I go back to the appropriating mind thing. And really, what I've gotten into is stuff like meditation. Um certain practices that dissolve that, start to dissolve that appropriating mind. And so what your consciousness through these practices comes to, you know, you guys talk about liminal places a lot. What these do is make your mind a liminal place where you don't identify by your job, you don't identify by your money, you don't identify by what you do. You identify, you try to eliminate those things of the mind like with the Japanese koan, it's designed to destroy that rational mind and bring in a new consciousness with paradox. It's like this paradox and contradictions. It's so out there in writings like Cervantes and uh, Lawrence Stern, Jorge Borges, Rabelais. And it's like their, their ideas are long lasting because it's like uh, G.K. Chesterton, another guy, through paradox and contradiction, they brought in a new consciousness that couldn't be related to you directly, rationally. It had to be through that other way. And that that new thing that's kind of snuck under uh, to you to start, starts to dissolve, can't talk, dissolve all those limitations of the rational mind. So that that's, if anything, since 2012, 
uh, I would say that's what's been going on with me and what's really opened me up and um, got me out there to make friends like you guys. I hope I'm still your friends after the North Korea comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think we, we, we're all right. And like I said, I kind of think that, well, I don't think the way, the, quite the way you put it. I, I think of it more of as a philosophical, you know, uh, apocalypse type, type of thing. Um, philosophically, I want the world to end. Mm -hmm. Not, I don't literally want it to end. I don't want people to get hurt. I don't want people to get destroyed. But I, I realize that, that our, our culture as it is is so corrupted and so stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talked earlier like about the earthquake and 9-11 and the way people step up in, in these tragedies if maybe we wouldn't need these tragedies if we would always be like that like why does it take a tragedy to see the best in people yeah you know it's like it's like the, my, my one of my big issues with christmas and people are like well it's christmas we should care for one uh, another it's like why aren't we doing that anyway you know <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I see <laughs> such hypocrisy that's my least favorite uh, time of the year <laughs> yeah oh mine too <laughs> and and that's it. That always drives me nuts. It's like, oh, it's Christmas. You got to care for each other. It's like, yeah, do it all the time. How about we try that? And things will be so much better on this planet. Yeah, it's, it, that's another thing that's disgusting. It's yeah. just marketed. Uh, I, I, hey, I don't like any. I'm like the goatiest guy you'll ever meet. I don't like birthdays. I don't like um, any <laughs> holidays. I like Halloween. Um, I don't even about like it. Halloween, <laughs> but yeah, it's just because it's so commercialized, and you have to do all this buy stuff and and lay down money, I, make people I, I, happy. I, I have over the years decided to celebrate my own holidays. Um, mm. since most of my social life revolves around my musical show, uh, the Last Exit, uh, we used to do a pre anniversary Pre end of the world show, uh, uh, whatever date fell closest to December twenty first, going all the way back to the nineties, it would be the pre pre oh, pre anniversary end of the world show, and it was just done very tongue in cheek because of the whole twenty twelve thing, and we would just say, well, we can't celebrate it after the end of the world, so let's <laughs> celebrate it now, you know, and we would have everything apocalypse themed and doom themed and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and just have some fun with it. Ooh. When you think about it, Halloween is sort of the same thing. It's a celebration of death, and uh, yeah, but it's when it's when you connect to the other side. Yeah, and that that has been completely removed from Halloween. And yeah, that's what eat it a is bunch of candy; it'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Here, it's a way for again. For, it's a way for the people selling the candy to make money. The people selling the costumes to mm. make money. The different businesses to capitalize on Halloween parties and stuff like that. I mean, that's that's really that's the actual meaning for these things anymore. Mm -hmm. For me, it's become something much more um, honoring ancestors and you know going to a quiet place or um, trying to breach the gap between that that other world. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking about. Uh, 2012, you know, and, and how the, the hype of the end of the world, you know, I mean, that was tone in cheekish way that Micah decided to go ahead and, 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 and organize the Paradigm Symposium with Scotty Roberts. You know, they were saying, well, if the world is going to end, you know, we might as well have the best party we have, <laughs> we can have, you know, and, and when he announced that, and I was like, oh my God, you know, this is it. Now it's my chance to finally go and meet all these guys whom before that, you know, they were only uh, letters on my computer screen or there were only decent voice, disembodied voices, you know, uh, on Skype. Right. And it's, it's funny how, you know, the end of the world was in a way the best time of my, of my life <laughs> or, or brought about the best time of my life because part of them for me was such a, uh, pivotal point, you know, I, I met Mike, and I met a lot of people, and then I decided to become even more involved with the, the, with the Fortean uh, scene online, you know, I decided to have my, have my first uh, podcast interview with two people I met 
on the Paradigm Symposium, Darren and Graham, who started their uh, their their own podcast, uh, the Grey America Show, and that was the first time that I, you know, accepted to be on a podcast. I, otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now, gentlemen. Wow. Hmm. So it's kind of like I, proof that you know the end of the world. Yeah, it's it <laughs> can mess you up, but it can also be you know. Uh, an opportunity for the change you're speaking of, Soraya. Hmm. Yeah, kind I, of. I, uh, I, sorry, kind of. Rather I, than be in fear, huddling, watching your news, waiting for it to happen, you guys kind of went out there and took a positive view of it. Mm-hmm. The uh, you know, and it, there's there's that whole dilemma, like. If an asteroid was headed toward Earth, should and, and there was no way to avert it, it was going to you know be an extinction level event. Should the government tell us? Oh yeah, you know. And I look at that and I'm thinking, if I was in charge, I don't know. I mean, because on the one hand, it seems like the 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 right thing to do would be to tell people so that they can choose to do whatever they want with their last days mm -hmm. but at the same time you know damn well there are people who are going to use that to do every horrible thing they can think of mm -hmm. you know and there's going to be panic and and it's going to you know it's like which, which way which way is the way that it should go do you have faith in humanity or do you take the realist approach and realize that probably won't go well and it'll end so quick they won't even know it do you guys remember a foreign film that dealt with that? Um, no, there's been a dealt few with a young American woman. films. I, maybe it was an American film. This was a young girl who was psychic, and she started. She was supposed to get married and started acting really weird. And it's because there was this meteor coming. It was a really, really good movie. But uh, yeah, that was kind of it. It they there's kept it secret. There's melancholia. Ah, that might have oh, been. Yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, that's about right. Which is incredibly dark, but that's also Nibiru. That's that's a, another planet coming. Hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I really liked that movie. I loved the I movie. I could never watch it again because the the depiction of depression in it was mm -hmm. so realistic and and dark. It was just mm -hmm. like holy crap. Um, there's also Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. Ah, uh, that's what's, uh, that's a good movie. Yeah, that was a really good movie. There's another one that I saw that was so bad, I can't even remember the name of it. Um, it had the guy who, a uh, big actor, he was in Antichrist. Uh, oh, what was his name? Antichrist, another movie people should not watch. If you've never seen it, count yourself lucky. <laughs> I think the worst thing that could happen tomorrow is uh, Stephen King's depiction of the meteor that hit and covered the guy in green <laughs> I remember that one. on creep show yeah <laughs> oh yeah that's right I remember that let's see if I can find the name of this other one uh, William Defoe that's who I'm thinking yeah. of he was in this end of the world movie. oh yeah, yeah Antichrist yeah yeah Antichrist is horrible like horrible it, and not that it's a bad movie it's just something that um, you're going to it's painful it's, yeah, it's painful to watch yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Oh, 444, Last Day on Earth. Um, and I thought, well, that sounds interesting. It's not. It's terrible. It's just a bad movie in every possible way. But it's one of those ones where they did tell the populace that the world is ending, and they're all coming up with their own ways on how to deal with that. There, there's a very old movie, Black and White. But this, Fred Astaire is part of it. In, in which this, it's the end of the world. There's been a nuclear war, but it's kind of like gradually, you know, uh, covering the earth with uh, radioactive uh, uh, air or something, right? So mm. for a time, this, these guys are still, you know, living as as, as normal. Right. Mm. You know, but they know that they're going to die, and and and, and then some some decide. Well, you know, I, I want to return to. They have a submarine, so I want to return to America. You know, because well, you know, I don't want to die here, and kind of like it's a it's a different take of, of, of on 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 the end of the world. It, it was kind of like uh, uh, when they thought that 
a nuclear war wouldn't be, you know, as globally catastrophic as we learn or or as we were taught to by the series, uh, you know, the day after. I saw that series when I was in, in, in uh, yeah. grade school in the 1980s, and I guess it traumatized me for life. Mm. <laughs> I think- yeah, I can see that. Do you guys remember, was it a Twilight Zone episode with the little nerdy guy with glasses and all he wanted to do yeah. was read books or something? Yep. He finally all the gets... time in the world, enough time at last, yeah. <laughs> One of the most famous ones, really. And then he breaks his glasses. <laughs> There's no one left to fix them. Mm. Uh, and isn't it interesting that one of the most popular, you know, cartoons of the last few years is an apocalyptic uh, story you know i'm talking about adventure no adventure time (laughs) i'm not familiar with it it. oh my god it's fantastic and it's you know it 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 takes place in the land of oo but then you learn that the land of oo is actually the earth after a nuclear war (laughs) Mm. there's a I mean, and there's so many different depictions of of how the world ends, too. I mean, there's the obvious ones like nuclear war or saying hitting us from space or, you know, I guess Nibiru goes up there as, you know, one of the ways the world could end, as unrealistic as it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also, you know, there's, you know, viruses and things like that Mm -hmm. to take us out very, very quickly. There was there was an interesting take uh, Straczynski did. The guy who did Babylon Five uh, did a show called Jeremiah, mm. where this virus killed everyone above a certain age. I think everyone above the age of puberty was uh, killed by this virus, and so the the world is basically given back to the children, who then have to remake society. Oh, jeez! It was a really good series, and. Uh, uh, I think it was Showtime it might have been on. And mm. he he ended up ending it early because they wanted there to be more sex and violence. And he liked Bab- like the same issue he had with Babylon 5 when they wanted that. And he said, yeah, that's not what I do. <laughs> do you guys rem- remember um, it was with it, M. Night Shyamalan? Shyamalan? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, it was with the wind. Oh, it was the happening. Oh, the- Yes. Yeah. yeah. I loved that one. I really, I, I like M Night Shyamalan. I know mm-hmm. a lot of people don't, but yeah, the one with the trees. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. I wasn't happy with the ending. I remember, but I really enjoyed the rest of it. It was, it was definitely interesting because you didn't know what was causing it, and everyone suddenly just wanted to kill themselves, mm. and and did so happily. <laughs> one of my favorite movies of all time is Children of Men by Alfonso oh. Cuarón. Yes. It's such a powerful movie, mm-hmm. you know, showing, you know, the world ending by simply, you know, there are no children, mm. yep. you know, coming into the world. So it's it's slowly uh, dying away and there's the, the despair that people feel of saying, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. Mm. And I think that he made a, a fantastic job on it. And the moment that, you know, they have this big confrontation. It's all a spoiler alert, by the way. This big confrontation, and then people see a baby for the first time, maybe in the whole in their whole lives, and mm-hmm. everybody stops. It's like seeing I don't know, it's the Virgin Mary, you know. And, and it was really, really powerful. And 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 I love the ending. You know, it's such it's so ambiguous. And then by the end of it, in the credits, it's only you know hearing the laughter of children. What's so there, is, there is a um, there is a book that was released that has been picked up by Netflix that's going to star Sandra Bullock called Bird Box and I ended up reading it. Um, I really liked it and the premise of it is that um, out of nowhere these beings appear on Earth and uh, they don't seem to be malevolent, but anyone who sees them ends up. Um, at the very least, committing suicide, if not, uh, you know, murder suicide of the people around them in the vicinity. Um, huh. And so it's about the mother's journey to get these children out of the house um, blindfolded. So I have no idea how they're going to film that, but <laughs> we'll see. But I thought that was a really, I thought that was a really uh, 
it's 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 been, it's been one of my favorite um, depictions of a post-apocalyptic civilization because um, everyone is so isolated and can't look outside that no one ever has any sense for how uh, how widespread the devastation is because people end up boxing themselves in their homes and covering up their windows and they have no idea for you know as as, as far as you know if there are any other people out there besides the people in their immediate vicinity. And I thought that was a really kind of interesting take. Yeah. I will have to look for that. That sounds really interesting. Did they say when it was going to be uh, uh, released? No, I, I know that it's been, I know that, that it's been cast and I just read the, uh, I read the book uh, this uh, summer uh, at the beach, um, mm. which is, it's a really quick read. Like I read it in like three days or something. Um, yeah. And, and you know, uh, that, that actually brings to mind now that you mentioned the beach, uh, it brings to mind another potentially apocalyptic scenario and a very realistic one is that of a solar outburst completely destroying our our power. Mm-hmm. Um, we rely so much on our power grid and our electricity that if we got hit with a big enough flare, mm-hmm. it's all gone. It's And we don't have, it's not like, oh, we just got to get it back up and running again. It's gone. There, there are no backup generators. There are no, there's no nothing. Um, we are not prepared for something on that level. It would destroy our culture. On you know, aside from maybe third world countries who aren't reliant on this type of stuff, um, our culture would completely collapse. And I don't even there's think a, you uh, would need such a powerful, you know, uh, flare that destroys the, the, you know, the, the power grid. On land, you know, and blowing up the the electric the electric uh, called transformers, you know. Mm-hmm. Think about a, a a flare that only knocks up, let's say, a third of our satellites, right? But we mm-hmm. our our civilization has become so dependent of our you know uh, uh, interconnectedness of our telecommunication systems. You know, think about all the uh, bank transactions that happen through the use of satellites. You know, money is mm-hmm. now is zeros and ones travel traveling through computers. So if you destabilize that only by knocking up one third of the satellites, I think that will be enough to create uh, a major catastrophe by slowly, you know... <laughs> Uh, through a snowball effect. Mm-hmm. There was a, a local author, I think his name was William R. Forston or Forster. He was a professor at a uh, college in Black Mountain. He wrote a book. I can't remember the name of it. I read it years ago. And the idea was the same. It was an EMP attack. And immediately everything was fried. I mean, your energy grid is gone. Um, all the electronics in the cars were knocked out. So only like, um, you know, really old cars were functioning. And, uh, Mm -hmm. that was the whole premise of the story. It just set us back to the dark ages. Yeah. Micah Hanks used to talk about that book. Uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what would happen. It would be the dark ages. The majority of the, of people like in the United States would probably die. There wouldn't be enough food. There wouldn't be enough anything. Um, you know, we rely so much on this this system we've built mm-hmm. and haven't protected from cosmic threats. I mean, without an energy grid, you don't have refrigeration. Right. And you won't have very much fuel. Because okay. Because everything... Oh, go ahead, please finish. No, go ahead. Okay. We're, we're, we're talking about this, and I, I remember the movie The Road, right? Nobody happens... Oh, yeah. Nobody knows what happens yeah. in that movie, just that, you know, it's the end of the world, and the guy's trying to get his kid to to the coast where it's warm mm-hmm. but then again that is the, the the way you guys you gringos are expecting the end of the world is becoming you know man <laughs> against man at that mm-hmm. dog eat the dog world and it doesn't have to be it could be an okay you the powers grid is gone and people try to get together and try to see how they can share the food but no with the American mentality is, no, I'm going to stockpile as many mm-hmm. weapons as I can because I just know that when the you know proverbial manure hits the fan, 
then my neighbor is going to try to come and get me and try to come and mm-hmm. get my stuff. So I'm, I have to be prepared for that. That's the whole Western thing of uh, we're individuals with individual freedom. We're autonomous. Um, it's so isolated us. And it individually and as a nation, um, even in states, on a state level, it's so isolated us all in through different levels of, of this. And um it's so different from the East, uh, where there is no real concept of, of this individualized freedom that we have. I mean, they don't care about uh, internet um, privacy or anything. Privacy isn't a big deal. Here, it's like huge. You know, I've got to have my privacy. And it's just such a different perspective on things than we have. And I think this isolationist, individualist attitude, we can see all around us how unhealthy it's been well i you know i'm i'm someone who very much you know values personal freedom but there is there there are there needs to be balance uh-huh. you know and that that's what you get lost in a lot a lot of ideologies like that is that there's no balance it's just all or nothing you know you have personal freedom to such you know they they want personal freedom to such a degree that it's it it becomes ridiculous mm-hmm. and nothing's enough Mm-hmm. Um. Totally forgot what I was going to say after that. You know, as as as, as uh, someone who was involved in, in the architectural business, you know, you 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 saw the 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 plans for the new uh, buildings that are developed in in cities, and it's almost like they are they are designed in order for people to never leave the building you know that's where you will live that's where you will also will you will work because there's it's a, a multi-purpose building that's uh, that's what they're called really and yeah and there's they also have malls they also have sports teams so it's this idea of being completely isolated from the rest of the mm. city Mm. You know that. Oh, yeah. Why don't? Why don't? Why do you want to go outside if you have everything you will ever need here, where you are safe and secure, mm. right? And it's almost like we are going back to the medieval times, in which you will have, you know, the castle that is surrounded by a moat, mm. and is surrounded by mm. this, you know, this big ass wall to try to fend away the barbaric invaders, and 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 it's. Uh, it's kind of like we are hoping uh, we are expecting that kind of like uh, destabilization of society and and I think that it's 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 this philosophical idea that uh, human beings are inherently bad or evil mm-hmm. and it, the only thing that prevents us from you know killing each other is the state and and laws, right? Right. It, it's this idea that people like Steve, uh, I think Steven Pinker, you know, have, and and others have saying that nature is, you know, a cruel, vicious, and uh, red in tooth and claw. Right. Mm-hmm. It, and and then the only thing that's preventing us from you know the total collapse is society you know the structure of society and the institutions that uphold society which is you know like law and government and the economy and obviously religion and if mm. you you know call, if all of those institutions are somehow you know threatened or get destroyed or obliterated well, then well you know it's it's every man by himself, but I, that's not necessarily the case. I think that's kind of like the myth that they have tried to sell us in order, number one, to be afraid of each other. And I mm-hmm. think that that yes. itself is a form of control. So is, yep. so is belief. Um, as long as you have, you know, even within Christian denominationalism, other religious uh, like I go back, go back to that appropriating mind. What it does is divide, make divisions. So politically, I mean, as those divisions grow and are more defined, an example would be 
conservatives and liberals here in America, the polarization becomes stronger until some violence erupts. But just to go like beyond that appropriating mind, which is what I'm calling it, it's a Buddhist term, to I think of a story Ram Das told about his guru who asked him to do right and love everyone. And he was like, Psh, well, that's impossible. You know, I can't do that. And then he realized when he, he was thinking I, he was thinking this I, this ego me. And he said, if I didn't think of myself like that, but if I thought of myself as just a soul amid a world of other souls just like me, and, you know, we're one in this thing. Then he said, if I came out, changed my perception over to that, of course I could do that. You know, of course I could love everybody. So it's just this perception of, I consider it belief. And this uh, is a consequence of the, this rational mind type, you know, Western uh, logic and, you know, got handed to, to us from Descartes and Kant. Like it really screwed us up. So if we could just change our perception over to something much bigger than these divisions, how yeah. much better things could be. Have you guys watched that, that movie called, uh, So in, it's a, a 1980s movie called Brainstorm. I love Brainstorm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Yeah. yeah, Brainstorm is with the one and only Christopher Walken, and it's the idea that these scientists create a machine capable of recording memories. Not only that, but also recording, you know, feelings. And mm -hmm. it's the, the I won't spoil you for you guys. Try to 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 try to find it. I don't know. I'm sure it's worth a watch. It's cool. worth a watch. But you know what I've been waiting. The 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 one invention that I think that needs to be created in order to try to save our society is some kind of empathy machine. Some kind of mm. thing that uh, if, if, if such a machi machine was created, I, I envision it to be used again against criminals, you know, against someone who raped someone. And you use that machine in order to uh, project into them all the suffering and all the pain yeah. that cr they created mm. on their victims, mm. right? I think of uh, Clockwork Orange. The machine was LSD. <laughs> mm. Well, there, there's also what's the name of the movie? Is it Powder? Oh yeah, true, true, true. Where the kid, kid had the ability to to show, like they, they had hunted the deer or whatever, and he walked out and he touched the deer and he touched the guy who shot the deer. And the guy just had a breakdown because mm -hmm. he could feel what the deer felt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thinking, let's. Uh, we're, we're talking about this and, and I'm talking about the Mexican filmmakers and there's another fa fantastic Mexican filmmaker, Alejandro González Iñárritu. You know, uh, he won the Oscar for the movie Revenant with, uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has recently created a virtual reality experience that is called, if I'm not, mis not mistaken, flesh and sand and, and and the purpose of this vr experience is to try to make the experiencer to feel what it feels like to cross the desert separating the you know the border between mexico and the united states mm. you know, and risk your life and, and and be subjected to the this the heat and the fear and the lack of water the, the same way that the people who you know, risk their lives in order to try to reach the United States. So in a way, this guy is trying to to create these experiences in order to 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 propitiate empathy about the suffering of these people and uh, you know to to the people who go and 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 and, and and put on the VR goggles, you know. That I, I guess maybe virtual virtual reality. I guess that is the highest purpose 
that such technology could have. It's not. I don't. I don't think virtual reality's purpose was to you know have us to uh, play video games, first pe person shooter video games, or you know just or to have the ultimate pornographic experience. I think that the ultimate purpose of VR is to create an empathy machine and try to connect to people uh, and try to experience life from mm -hmm. their their perspective. I think of um, some of these people, especially deep into meditation, who claim to have experienced or remembered their past lives I'm not talking about the ones who are like Cleopatra and stuff. I'm talking about um, certain masters who said they've reincarnated to the infernal realms. They've reincarnated as um, women from, you know, 2,000 years ago, men, all different categories of people and beings, really. Mm -hmm. And how that must like totally change how they change their perception like what you're talking about experiencing life through the eyes of somebody else who was you which that's kind of like this avatar idea you're talking about how the reality of that experiencing it must totally change their their consciousness and perception which really super interest me in uh, that possibility mm -hmm. so in the in the seth material uh Seth doesn't make very many predictions about anything at all. It's one of the things he tries not to do for the most part. Mm. But someone kept asking him about Christ, and when, when is Christ coming back? And Seth said, well, you don't understand what that means. He said, but, and I think he said in 2016, someone would be born who would have the ability to show people their past lives. Hmm. Mm. And it would completely change everything about our culture because suddenly things like racism and sexism and stuff would just go out the window. Wow. Now, whether this is a real thing or not, the very idea makes perfect sense. If you if you have past lives and someone could you know walk up to you and touch you, and you would suddenly remember those past lives, mm -hmm. I mean, it would be very hard to hold a racist uh, sort of attack towards someone or a sexist pose if if you know you'd been in that position before in your life. That is really cool. I didn't know that. This, you know, all, all three things are. I mean, that would be the purpose of past lives. I think uh, mm -hmm. yeah. to grow yeah. us. It's just something's blocking our memory, which is what's causing suffering, which is attachment <laughs> to mere material things. <laughs> the system. And, and see, my feeling is there's nothing wrong with material things. It's the attachment to mm, the Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, everybody always wants to say that money is the root of all evil, but it's actually the want of money that is the root of all evil. Yes. It's mm. greed. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, yes, I, I like the stuff I have, but I also understand that if something happened and I lost it, it's not the end of the world because it wasn't me. Mm. You know, yeah. I might miss it a little bit, but, you know, that that is it's transitory to begin with and, you know everything everything is yeah and, and and guys there's there's been actual stories down here of people who uh when the the earthquake was happening you know they did the right thing they they got out of their apartment buildings or their office buildings you know they waited the earthquake to stop they felt that the worst had happened, what did they do? They returned inside in order mm. to get their things, and that's when the building collapsed. Oh, man. They got trapped, and they got killed. Huh. Dang. Wow. So, yeah, the attachment the attachment can kill you. There's, there are stories of, of airplane crashes, you know, and, 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 and the, the, the plane managed to... to to crash land and there's a fire and there's nothing that would have prevented the people from actually walking away unharmed but then you real then everybody dies because of the fire and then they try to to investigate the causes of it and they realize that the, the cause was that some of the, the passengers were trying to retrieve mm their goddamn bags and they were blocking mm -hmm. the aisle and yeah. that 
caused the death of everybody. Same thing with uh, house fires. People going back in to get their stuff. Yeah. And and there's certain things I can understand more than others. Someone wanting to grab an old photo album. Yeah, or your, you your or your dog. You know that that. I well, yes, definitely your pet. I could very much understand that. I mean, because that's a living thing. Yeah. Joshua's like my papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I would. Like yeah, I would, <laughs> I would legitimately freak out. Yeah, or the. Yeah, I feel like I feel like maybe instruments are a little bit different too, because you you sort of get a. A particular, you know, um, relationship almost with the instrument, you know. But it is replaceable. It most is replaceable, things, yes. Most things in the end are replaceable. It's just that, so, you know, like I said, an old photo album. Those photos mm-hmm. probably are not replaceable. It's yep. the irreplaceable stuff that, that gets a little more value, and it's understandable that it gets value. In the grand scheme of things, it still doesn't mean anything more, but it means something to you right now. Mm-hmm. You know, um, is it uh, Jeff Ritzman? What about him? He talks about um, he's how routine and uh, kind of yes. he had too much stuff going on, so he says routine kind of you know dulls it out. Yeah, and I think of this that being a source of identity and a source of attachment, uh, kind of a, you know. This is who I am. This is what I do. And my goal is to get out of that, do the exact opposite, <laughs> to create a liminal space, not just with like a um, uh, job or, or moving thing. You know, Kelly and I just moved out to Mars Hill. We're in the middle of 160 acres in untouched mountainous terrain. And it, it is a liminal space. We were terrified the f- to first two weeks, but now we absolutely love it. It's beautiful here. Just amazingly quiet, dark at night. You can see all the stars. But it's not just about creating a liminal space in life things, but I think also what I'm getting into very seriously now is creating that liminal space in consciousness and realizing that not only are my things not me or the things I do not me, but also my thoughts, they're really screwed up. (laughs) And they're not me either. And finding out really who am I? If I'm not any of those things, who am I? And you come to this void, this place, and um, kind of becomes a crisis. And then I think um, people who have been through that, you know, I mentioned all, I, I was thinking about where you're talking about it. I don't know what I would grab when I went out of the house. I don't think there's anything that I would because in that 2012 transition of life falling away, Everything fell away that meant anything to me, and uh, I don't really have anything that I really super care about. It all, nothing really mattered after that. So I think people that have been through this type of thing come away. It the it's horrible, it's terrible, but you come away with this like functional intelligence, mm-hmm. and it breeds compassion. Once you've been through something really dark like that. And you get this, like I'm talking about this new perception. I keep talking about it like that. That's different from everything else. Different from, you know, what this crap we see around us. Fair enough. So let's see. What what, what can we take away from the concept of the apocalypse? Um, in its heart, it means change. Um, you probably do not have to worry about dying in some massive uh, end-of-the-world scenario anytime soon. And if you do, you probably won't know about it in advance. Um, change, is, change is a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, as much as we try not to change, we change every day. And it, it's that resistance to change that sometimes causes us the most problems. Um, what else? What else can we take away from? This? I would just uh, uh, agree with that, and just say that we are in a perpetual apocalypse. Life mm-hmm. is change. Well put. Uh, change is life. So, and it's that, and like I said, it's that resistance to change that generally causes us problems. But like, if you go with it, then those problems don't don't quite manifest the same way. 
You know, it's almost like you're you're a willing participant in the change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And trusting, trusting, and having the hope that uh, this is designed for something, and trusting in that change and going with it. Yeah, exactly mm-hmm. like you say. You and you start to see things like if I told you guys how many synchronicities have been happening over the last since we got out here, it's just ridiculous. And so I'm like, this cannot be wrong. Um, following this stuff, going out on a limb, it's just everything about it seems right. It's scary, but more rewarding than anything I've ever done. So it's your it's your own personal apocalypse. Yeah. And, and again, we all have those, and we we will we will be doing a show at some point, hopefully soon, on the dark night of the soul, which kind of could be called your own personal apocalypse as well. Mm. Uh, um, there was something else I was going to say about it, um, but you know, in in there are always going to be people trying to scare you and kind of throw that idea out there that, oh, this is the end, give us money. <laughs> if they're asking for money and it's the end of the world, what are they going to do with it? Exactly. That, <laughs> that's right there. This. <laughs> <laughs> it's for later. God wants it. Uh, you'll be like the guy with all the books. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you, you even get that in some of these apocalyptic movies and shows. You know, They'll say, well, we'll give you all this money. And they're like, and? You know, like, what, what's that going to do for me? When it comes down to survival, money's not really going to do it in a post-apocalyptic landscape. Yeah, I guess the, Although the, there will st- the final revelation that the apocalypse gives is to show you what really is important in yes, your life. What is, goes back to- what is the thing that you're going to grab you know, when your, your house is tumbling down you know what is the thing that you're going to who is the person that you are going to think of in that final you know moment of of existence and that kind of goes back to that quote i read at the beginning from mel wyman about burning everything down so you can see things as they really are you see what's really important to you Mm -hmm. you see what really matters when you lose everything Mm -hmm. and you know as a philosophical apocalypse you know, can do that to you. It can it can really straighten out your life in a way, as miserable as it may seem when it's happening. You suddenly realize this is what matters. This is what I will miss from my life. It it if anything, it makes you grateful for what you have. Yeah, yeah. I I called it a functional intelligence that breeds compassion. Something like I said, somebody that's been through that, they have something that's much deeper. And broader than people who haven't been in through anything like that have. They have a deeper understanding and knowledge and compassion that just can't be uh, compared to anything else. Yes. When yeah. when the big uh, earthquake in September 19, 1985 happened, and I was eleven years old, you know, I was, uh, uh, it was it was still morning. I was preparing for school, and you know the. The thing happened, and then I realized it was really, really shaking violently. And the thing that I did was, you know, run downstairs to find my mom. I say, Mom, 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 está temblando, está temblando. And, 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 and she was just as scared as I was. And and I remember that I went to to, to hug her, and we were there, you know. And, and I guess, you know, if, if we had been in, in, in a different part of the city, that's where... You know, it would have ended for us. So, I guess that that apocalypse revealed to me one of the things that is uh, the most of, of the most importance in my life, which is you know my mother. Mm. There was uh, pulling another bit from Seth. Seth talks about uh, the floods that happened in Elmira shortly before the the channeling of this, you know, there was massive floods in Elmira where Gene Roberts and, and Robert Butts lived and uh, did tons of damage to the city and stuff. And Seth explained that in the bigger scope of reality, sometimes these he- things happen because they need to, because these things bring people together and in a very literal way kind of cleanse out some of the stuff that's stopping things from moving forwards. Mm-hmm. 
So when you look again at the idea of an apocalypse, it's the, the idea of cleansing these things. And maybe we have these disasters when collectively we realize we need them, you know? Well, that reminds me of how, you know, in, in, in our ancient culture, they had these legends of, the, uh, of how the world has ended four times prior to our right. current world. And now we live in, 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 in the fifth sun, you know. And the name for the fifth sun in the Nahuatl tongue is um, Olin Tonatiu. Tonatiu is the word for sun. And Olin in, in ancient Nahuatl is the word for movement. So people, the idea is that, you know, the world would end by movement. And some people say, well, you know, that sh means that the world would end by, you know, earthquakes. But uh, I, I just lost I thought, my. I thought I heard an earthquake. Of, yeah, I just. <laughs> uh, 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 what was going with that? Yeah. Uh, earthquake, Olin, Tonat. Oh, the, oh, move, the, the idea is that movement, at, 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 as terrible as it may sound, is the recipe for stagnation. Because I think the, world, the worst thing that, that can happen to the universe is to remain static. Mm. You know, that takes me back to your question, Soraya, about heaven and how could possibly a perfect place remain perfect in perfection? Because I, I, since I've become a little bit more nuanced, what we call evil, these things, you know, these scary things, demons, whatever, these horrible experiences, the natural disasters, the bad things that happen to us in life are really the greatest catalyst for growth. And so what would a perfect place, I mean, it seems like it would just be rotten from the inside out. Uh, I think of uh, um, H.G. Wells' uh, time machine, you know, in the earth, mm -hmm. outside it was perfect looking, but it was shallow and inside it was Morlocks. So I come to like this sort of a non-dualistic uh, concept that... You know, this stuff is really horrible, but necessary. And that's something a lot of people don't understand. I mean, it, with, without the negative in the world, we wouldn't have the positive. We wouldn't recognize the positive. True. I mean, for those, peop for those people who, who, who have everything, who everything is just handed to them, those people, they, they don't move forwards. They get bored. You know, I mean, because they don't have to struggle for anything. They don't have to earn anything. Nothing means anything to them anymore um, because everything's handed to them. There's no challenge in life. Life needs that up and down. You need the bad to feel really good. Well, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons that um, Gordon White says universal basic income wouldn't work, and I tend to agree with him, is because where you see crime is in the deprivation of meaning of life. You know, we have this... We have this, you know, socialist utopian idea that if we just give everybody a living wage, they'll create great amounts of art. But what happens uh, whenever similar programs have ever been unveiled is uh, there's a deprivation of meaning. And people, you know, when, when their needs are met, they tend to try to sort of act out, um, which I think is a compelling argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. All right, Josh, you sound like you're fading. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. But you are going to Ireland soon. I am thrilled. Um, I'm going to try to not uh, sob and wet my pants every single day. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I believe you might have finished a book. I did on on uh, on Thursday, yesterday. Uh, I, I just finished my, the first draft of... Uh, of my latest book. So now I sit it, sit it down and, uh, don't look at it. <laughs> don't look at it for a while. Then I'm going to come back to it and <laughs> read it a couple more times and make some changes. And then I'll start, uh, sending it out to people to take a look at it. Nice. Very cool. All right. And of course people can find you where Josh, Joshua And, uh, Aaron, uh, you can find me at charm, the or somebody tweet at me at, at Charm the Water. 
Okay. And red pill? I don't want to plug in any of my uh, sites. I just want to ask people if they are willing or able to make a donation you know, to the relief of, of, of the victims mm -hmm. of, the, of the Mexican earthquake. You know, I, I'm sure there are plenty of international NGOs who you know, will be able to, to, to take your donation and, 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 and bring it to, to the victims. So if you can do that, you know, that will thank you profusely in this life and the next after, after the end of the world. <laughs> yes, after, after the rapture comes. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much. This has been an interesting conversation. Pleasure as always. It was an honor.